Did someone say never say never again? We'll find out this week on Motoring 2007. TSN's Motoring 2007 is brought to you by Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward. This was a scene not long ago when I took part in my very first Jeep Jamboree. This was in Northern Ontario. Now I know a lot of you are not going to like this, but I said not only was it my first, it would be my last. I mean, mosquitoes, black flies, trail guides telling me to turn left, turn right. You're not holding the steering wheel properly. My reaction was whatever, because I'm not coming back. Well, never say never, because this week I'm off-roading again. Why? Well, because I get my first chance to see the famous Rubicon Trail just outside of Tahoe. This is where Chrysler is introducing its new Jeep Wrangler. And I couldn't resist coming out here to watch what many consider to be the ultimate off-road vehicle take on the ultimate off-road trail. The Rubicon Trail, uh, it's an old wagon road, originally an Indian trail. Of course, the Indians were coming in here for many, many years from both California and Nevada. But in 1887, the Rubicon Trail was dedicated as an El Dorado County road. It's probably the most famous trail in the world. Jeep, for many, many years, has been using the Rubicon as their ultimate testing and proving grounds for Jeep vehicles. In fact, we designed and built a test facility at Chelsea Chrysler's Proving Grounds duplicating, say, the five worst sections of the Rubicon Trail. Brought in $50,000 worth of rocks and boulders. A Jeep owner, it's just like a Harley Davidson owner. It's a brand loyalty, it's something, and there's only one Jeep, and a lot of imitators. But uh, coming in here, my first trip was 1951, and then we started in 1953, the Jeepers Jamboree. Once you go through on the trail, and if you have a guest with you, and you see how it's done, and they get excited, and the next thing they do, they go out and buy a Jeep. It's a brand loyalty, and as they say, it's just something that uh, you kind of get hooked on. <laughs> it's a phenomenal trail. People do come from all over the world to drive it. I've always wanted to drive it. I've read about it, I've seen photographs of it, and when you actually get on it, it's, it lives up to its reputation. It's a very serious off-road trail in stunning scenery. The current TJ Wrangler has been in the marketplace for 10 years. There's very few vehicles that have the capability to stay in the marketplace for that length of time. Um, with new federal regulations, safety regulations, right now is the right time to reinvent the Wrangler, if you will. Our loyal customers are very interested in telling us what they want. And they want more comfort, they want more convenience, they want more features, they want more safety, and they always want more capability. And at the same time, they tell us not to change anything because they love their Wrangler. So they love the fold-down windshield, the fact that the doors are removable, uh, the solid front and rear axles from a capability standpoint, uh, the frame construction of the vehicle. So we've kept all of those things, but we've improved them. We are uh, launching the Jeep Wrangler. It's the first time that Wrangler has been launched in the Canadian market, and it's going to be launched in the Wrangler two-door and the Wrangler Unlimited, which is the all-new vehicle and uh, it's going to start with a, with a fantastic price. $19,995 is the uh, new starting from price for the uh, all-new Jeep Wrangler. Powertrain, 3.8 liter V6 engine, uh, 202 horsepower, 237 foot-pounds of torque, so more horsepower, more torque, better fuel economy, and that engine mounts to both a four-speed automatic transmission as well as a six-speed manual transmission, the six-speed manual being the standard transmission. What impressed me the most was the, the Wrangler Unlimited, which is longer uh, than the regular Wrangler. Handled the course very, very well. I didn't get hung up. Uh, I found it very capable, and more than I thought it would be, because um, typically with off-roading, short of the wheelbase, 
the more agile. The truck made a good 4x4 driver out of me. I, I, I pretty much just uh, put it in gear and took my foot off the clutch and let it uh, creep along by itself. And um, I didn't get into any difficulty, uh, although I, I think that if I was in a less competent vehicle, I probably would have got hung up on top of a rock. You know what the best thing is? You know, you were there and we walked up uh, Cadillac Trail and watched some of the vehicles. You can't physically walk up that trail, but yet these vehicles climbed up effortlessly. And that's what's really amazing. When you, when you see um, those vehicles go through their paces and watch people um, you know, drive and experience it firsthand, it's really what Jeep is all about. How is it for you? Oh, I'm just having a great time. I'm trying to find a washroom, that's my problem. Ah, the second shooter on the grassy knoll, the 100 mile per gallon carburetor. We love our conspiracy theories, and I'll debunk one later on Kenzie's Corner. The all-new crossover market is growing at an alarming rate. That fact spurred this vehicle. On this edition of Test Drive, the much-anticipated Ford Edge. One of the things that's going to help the Edge sell is found beneath its shiny sheet metal. In simple terms, it shares its platform with the Fusion, a car capable of carving a twisty road with precision. Where the edge differs to the Fusion is in the suspension. Gone are the double wishbones in favor of front struts. In the scheme of things, it makes little difference, as this is not the type of vehicle that moves the driver to challenge a faster on-ramp, or the pylons for that matter. That stated, the edge's handling is tight and body roll is limited to a handful of degrees before the suspension takes a set. The upshot is a more compliant ride when the road gets rough. When compared to the Mazda CX-7 and Acura RDX, it's positively plush in its ride quality. Come on, baby. There we go. You know, it's pretty obvious that this car wasn't built for a pylon test. Having said that, the fact it's based on a car chassis means it's not as truck-like as most SUVs. Where it is truck-like, well, it's the turning circle. At just shy of 12 meters, this thing takes an awful lot of real estate to turn around. Unfortunately, the brakes do not follow the rest of the Edge's successful formula. Working on four-wheel discs, the standard anti-lock system does deliver a crisp pedal, but rather long stops that measure 48 meters from 100K. You know, this Ford Edge comes very nicely equipped. If you go with the base model, there's only seven options. And if you go with this SEL, the one we're testing, there's only six options. That means that on this vehicle, 18-inch wheels, leather, backup sensor, cruise control, and all the usual power items are standard equipment. As for the popular options, navigation system, in-car entertainment, big sunroof. Now, as for the nits to pick, there really is only one, and it has to do with the warning lights. The warning lights for the ESP and the overdrive sit right in the extremities of the instrument panel. That means if you inadvertently turn off the overdrive, you're going to drive fuel economy up needlessly because the warning light is not doing its job. Power comes from a willing 3.5-litre V6 that pushes 265 horsepower and 250 pound-feet of torque at 4,500 RPM. This is enough to motivate the 1,946 kilogram edge to 100K in eight seconds and perform the 80 to 120 move in a quick 6.2 seconds. It's also quiet and civilized when pushed towards redline. Now, part of the reason for this lively feel and hushed ride is the six-speed automatic transmission and its ability to service divergent needs. First and second gears are short, which delivers an enthusiastic launch, while the tall overdrive gear helps fuel economy. When it comes to versatility, the Edge is better than most in this category. To begin with, 32 cubic feet of storage space with the seats in the upright position. If you go with the SEL, you simply push a little button 
The seat folds flat, now you've got 70 cubic feet of storage space. You'll also find a centre console box that's large enough to carry a laptop computer and the front seat will fold flat. That means you can carry a ladder inside with the tailgate closed. The one shortcoming, this glass should open independently of the tailgate. Unfortunately, it doesn't. The optional all-wheel drive system constantly monitors the available traction and begins to divvy up the power the instant wheel spin occurs. It's also layered with advanced track, which is a sophisticated stability and traction control system. This extension means the edge is capable of transferring its torque both to the front and rear and to the left and right. In practice, it delivers a balanced feel to the drive. Even with two wheels on gravel and the gas matted, it pulls away with minimal fuss. Advanced track sophistication continues with an active roll mitigation system. By monitoring the vehicle's roll angle and the rate it's changing, the system picks up on a potential roll. It then backs out of the gas and applies the appropriate brake in an attempt to counter the wayward situation. This Ford Edge is a decidedly decent set of wheels. It drives very nicely on the highway, it handles better than just about any SUV, it's got plenty of power and a ton of versatility. Overall, a very complete package. My wife, however, did make an interesting observation. She said if she was going to drive something this large on a daily basis, she'd want it to hold more than five passengers. Make you think. It's time to update our long-term Hyundai Sonata. We put just over 10,000 kilometers on it and had one oil change. We've had no annoying squeaks or rattles that can quickly end the new car honeymoon. In fact, the more I drive this car and other Hyundai product, the better I understand why Hyundai is the fourth best-selling import in North America behind Honda, Toyota, and Nissan. They're putting out good product with real value. Not only is this a great looking car, but it has plenty of interior space. In fact, it has 121.7 cubic feet, giving this midsize car a large car feel, especially in the back seat and plenty of room also in the trunk. As for the powertrain, well, the horsepower increased from 181 to 237, and it's given this vehicle a brand new personality. You know, the Honda Accord has always set the standard in this segment, but Hyundai could be the company trying to push up that benchmark. The X5 was introduced back in 1999 to the world market and has been a tremendous success for BMW with close to 600,000 units uh, on the road to this point in time. Uh, in Canada, 18,000 units on the road uh, up to the year 2006. As with any BMW, uh, we expect benchmark driving and dynamics in this segment. And that starts with the engine. We will come to Canada with two versions, the BMW X5 3.0 SI, which has an inline six cylinder uh, that produces 260 horsepower. Uh, it's a magnesium alloy block, the lightest engine in its segment. We will also have an eight cylinder, the 4.8i BMW X5 that features our Valvetronic technology, which increases performance and reduces fuel consumption at the same time. So on the performance side, we've upped the ante, so to speak, on uh, what was the benchmark in the segment. I think that the new X5 is going to be even better than the old one because it marries the previous version's excellent handling without the jarring ride that the predecessor had, which wasn't exactly perfect for Canadian roads. Rear seats are best left for six-year-olds. Even 10-year-olds will find it very cramped. As for me, my knees were up around my ears. My head was right to the ceiling. It, it, it was not comfortable even for a very short jaunt. 
if you want to uh, transport a hockey team, you need a minivan. You don't need a sport utility, and, and this one is best kept for five passengers. You know, we've been on the Rubicon Trail now for over three hours, and we're only doing half the course, but they say I'm only a third of the way through. But the good news, it's a great day, no bugs, and maybe most importantly, I'm still alive so far. Anyway, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Billy, I know he loves trucks, but I don't know if this is his thing either. How about it, Bill? Here we go. Oh, off-roading's lots of fun, Brad, especially when you're in somebody else's vehicle. When it's your own, you're always worried about damaging, at least I was anyways. But uh, I want to talk about probably the ultimate off-road pickup truck that I've ever seen anyways, and that would be the new Dodge Power Wagon, which Chrysler reintroduced in 2005. And the Power Wagon, if you remember them years and years ago, I mean, Simon and Simon used to drive them on their show, one of my favorite private eye shows. But the uh, Power Wagon was a meat and potatoes, raw-boned four-wheel drive pickup. Well, when they brought it back, it's still a raw bone, big, tough pickup truck. But now they've integrated lots of electronics into the running gear, the chassis of this truck, to make it, you know, give you the best of both worlds, give you great on-road performance and great off-road performance too. Now talking about damaging a vehicle, when you pull up to a curbstone in your car, you always cringe because the front end usually catches the curbstone. Well, in a pickup, you don't worry about that because, I mean, curbstones pretty much don't exist, right? And in the power wagon, well, they're just like, uh, you know, maybe a ripple in the pavement. You hardly even feel them. You could go right over them if you want in this vehicle. But there's an, a component under the front of this vehicle that I want to show you. And that's the front stabilizer bar. And what they've done on the power wagon is they've given you the option of decoupling the front stabilizer electronically from inside the cab. Now, as soon as you shift the power wagon into four-wheel drive high or low, you're able to decouple the front stabilizer bar. Now, the front stabilizer bar, as the name implies, stabilizes the vehicle and allows you to have good on-road performance. So in other words, when you've got a vehicle that's as high as this one and as heavy as it is and as powerful, this one's over 300 horsepower, you've got to have a lot of control in that front end. And the stabilizer bar gives you a nice flat level attitude when you're doing lane changes or cornering on an on or, on or off ramp. It keeps your vehicle flat and stable. If the front stabilizer bar was not there, you'd get a lot of body roll. The thing would really lean, and it would want to roll over easily on an off-ramp. So that stabilizer bar does a lot for you on-road, but it actually works against you off-road. So what they've done is they've given you the option of decoupling or disconnecting the front stabilizer bar electronically from inside the cab. First vehicle I've ever seen with that feature. And a matter of fact, it's an industry first for this segment. There's our front stabilizer bar, the link kit at the end, and here's the section that decouples the front stabilizer electronically from inside the cab. Now, what you do is, is decouple the front stabilizer bar, and now it allows all that travel that's built into the front of the suspension to work for you, it allows the front wheels to float up and down over uh, extreme terrain, and the, if the front stabilizer bar was hooked up, it would limit a lot of that travel. Now, the old Dodge Power Wagons didn't have as much travel in the front suspension. Matter of fact, nobody's truck had as much travel as the current models do. So now, they've allowed you to decouple that front stabilizer bar, get all that travel that was designed into the front suspension in there, so you've got a great off-road vehicle, and as soon as you reach 18 miles per hour or decouple the front stabilizer bar, it, it couples back up and away you go and you're back in on-road mode, you got the best of both worlds. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2007. The current conspiracy theory holds that some combination of the oil companies and General Motors conspired to kill the electric car. Well, I'm not buying it. First of all, the oil companies, well, if they didn't use their petroleum to make gasoline, they'd make more nylon stockings. As for General Motors, well, why would they spend billions of dollars developing the EV1 electric car only to deliberately kill it? The fact is, General Motors couldn't give the EV1 away. And the problem with the EV1? It was the same problem facing the Baker Electric in the early 1900s, 
failure to supply a long enough extension cord. That's right, because the issue with electric cars has always been range. How much power can you get per kilogram of weight? It's called energy density. Now, a friend of mine actually worked on the EV1 project for a number of years, and he said there are three types of liars in the world. There are liars, damned liars, and battery engineers. They'll promise you anything, but the delivery, eh, it comes up short. Now, if the vehicle only has to do maybe 60, 80 kilometers in an urban environment and can be plugged in overnight, like a local delivery van, electric cars can be fine. But that's not the type of performance we expect from our cars. We expect to be able to get into a car in Vancouver, let's say, and drive to Kamloops or Toronto to Montreal, maybe stop once for gasoline. But if you're in an electric car at night in the winter with the heater and the lights and the wipers going, that's not going to happen. It's a matter of that energy density thing. Now, hybrids, now maybe they can be a short-term solution, but like electric cars, hybrids carrying around hundreds of kilograms of extra batteries, weight that it's carrying, whether it's using it or not, and that's just not very elegant from an engineering perspective. In fact, if you want to do something for the environment, maybe the best thing you could do is buy the biggest, thirstiest SUV you can find, petition the government to ban hybrids, use up all that petroleum faster so we can get to the only true alternative, and that's hydrogen. But that's a story for another day. I'm Jim Kinsey. You know, we only traveled half the Rubicon Trail today. That's nine miles, but it took over five and a half hours to complete. And I can't tell you how fatiguing it was. Now, unlike my first off-road experience, that I actually enjoy this one? Well, the course, the day, the truck, it was outstanding. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Would I do it again? Absolutely not. It's just not my cup of tea. But having said that, there were a few journalists from Off-Road Magazines here. They told me this Jeep is the best yet, and it really has very little competition when it comes to its off-road capabilities. Now, remember earlier I was complaining about those trail guides that were always nagging me that first time I went off-roading? Well, believe me, the men and women today, if it wasn't for them telling me to where to go on this dangerous course, I wouldn't be standing here now. But I am, and I'll be back next week to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. I think it's a combination of the fact that the cars represent really good value, that they have a great warranty, and, uh, and that the quality is there. And apparently, uh, Kia buyers are among the most loyal in the industry. So people who've owned them seem to want to buy them again. TSN's Motoring 2007 has been brought to you by Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward.